All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another outstanding Authors of Google speech. Um, today, we're very honored to welcome a, a modern hero and a modern crusader for peace. Um, John Dow is here today to speak to us about his book, God Grew Tired of Us, and his current work through the John Dow Foundation. Now, John's book is all about hope, from his childhood as a refugee of, during the Sudanese Civil War to his settling in, in America as one of the lost boys of Sudan to the current work from, and his social entrepreneurship from the, the John Dow Foundation. He's an international human rights activist and a recipient of the National Geographic Emerging Explorers Award. Um, today, the John Dow Foundation aims to improve the um, healthcare situation in, in South Sudan. And with the uh, founding of the Republic of South Sudan just this week, um, John's work and his words have even more relevance. As his clinics um, continue to, to gain momentum and to have an impact in South Sudan, um, John and his foundation continue to work to make the world a better and more peaceful place. Now, we'll have some time at the end for some questions and answers, so please use the mic um, during that time. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming John to Google. Thank you very much. You know, what I'm going to do today to, uh, 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 what I'm going to talk to you about to, today is, I'm going to talk to you about my life story. And, um, and before I say it, I, I don't know whether Anastasia Anad is here. I'm not sure whether she's here. Uh, are you here? Are you here? Can you get up a little bit? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. She was the one who actually, first of all, she donated to the John Dow Foundation to, to my clinic. She didn't know us. I have never met her. This is my first time now to see her. And, uh, and she suggested that I should come to Google and talk or share my story with, with uh, employees. So, Ananasia, thank you very, very much for uh, your uh, uh, generosity and uh, suggesting the, uh, me that I should be one of the speakers in the Google list. Uh, thank you very much. I, um, I'm going to share what I'm going to talk to you is, as I said before, is, is, is my life story. And I call it a, a living testimony. Why am I calling it living, uh, living testimonies? Because that's a, I'm going, uh, that, that's a life that I went through and I still well, I'm still alive. And um, I think when you go out later, you would maybe at some point you will share with your friends or some family members or co-workers. Uh, and so the story go from me to you and then from you to somebody else, it's kind of keep going. It's a, and that's why I call it living testimony. As Cliff said before, I came from a country called Sudan. By the way, have you guys been watching uh, uh, television last two days? For those who watch, actually, you saw that uh, Sudan split into two, which means the southern part of our country, southern part of Sudan, where I came from, became independent. It is the Republic of South Sudan now. So I'm no longer a Sudanese. I am now a Southern Sudanese uh, citizen. And actually, it's, 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 it's about three days old country. Just very new. It was just born uh, uh, two, uh, three days ago. So uh, I think most of you have been very excited about it, and I am excited about it. And of course, people in South Sudan are also excited about it. But I'm going to talk to you about the story that led into the split of the country. Why uh, this one big country in Africa split into two. It happened when, um, when I was a little boy. Uh, war started in 1983 and stopped in 2005. And actually, at the time, I was at my uh, village running up to my father's cows, taking care of goats and sheep, and, and it was just good. There was no school anyway. Um, there was no civilization, nothing. But we were very happy. 
It was a country that we call, uh, that a country that flew with milk and honey. It was just wonderful. My family attending wedding and ceremonies and um, celebrations. It was just good. But until 1987, when I was 12 years old, it was a time when my village was attacked. It was attacked in the middle of night as my, my brother and I, we were sleeping in our own house. See, in the United States, you have one big house and you have little room in it. In Africa, you have uh, your father builds house of the boys and for the girls and for the visitors. It's kind of in a semicircle, little huts around, uh, around the compound. So my brothers and I were sleeping in our own house. The, the bomb, the sound of bomb, the whistling of bullets in the middle of the night woke us up, in the, you know, and then we heard people crying outside and screaming and also we got, we knew that there's something going on outside or something wrong. So we got out and when I got out, I saw somebody running acro across my uh, our, our home compound and I thought it was my father. This is in the middle of night, it's very dark. So I was running up to this man that I thought was my father and then later, uh, you know, the long line of troop from the northern Sudan were coming and shooting and so we kind of we went into uh, the, 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 the pass, the roadside and then we hide there. When we got back to that, road, uh, that pass, the guy I thought was my father was my neighbor. And I was with this man throughout the night, and in the morning, I was uh, telling him that I would go back to see my, my, my family. And he said that I should go with him. So, I went, so I, I went with him, and we went for about almost three days with no food, really. really. And, 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 and I remember, you know, in the United States, you go for one day without food, you say you're going to die. <laughs> but it didn't happen, so we kept going and kept going and then we ran into uh, uh, a woman with her two daughters and we became five, five of us were, were going. Honestly, the night was just very cold. Nothing to eat. We only live on wild fruits. It was just terrible. We shoot grass like a cow so that we can stay alive. And then we kept going that woman and, and, and her two daughters were abducted to be taken to Northern Sudan. I think they were taken to become their wife or concubine or how you may call it. They were taken to Northern Sudan. At some point, we were beaten by uh, the Arab troop, uh, especially the Northern Sudanese troop. If you see my body now, you can see a lot of scars. Why? Because of, at some point, I thought I you know, I'm going to die. I mean, it didn't happen. So we kept going. Later, some of the boys that were coming from different, uh, di different uh, villages and different uh, route, and so we came, we were only two now because the other, the woman and her two daughters were abducted, and so two of us remained. And then later, we were uh, nine, and then 19, and then 27 of us. Most of us all lost boys. So we were going toward Ethiopia, from my village toward Ethiopia. Now, from my village toward Ethi to, to Ethiopia, it took us about uh, two moons. What I mean two moons at the time, we didn't know how to read and write. We didn't know there is a, uh, what time of the month or day of the month. We didn't know. This is just when the moon come up and, and the moon goes down, 15 days and then 15 day, other 15 days, make it 30. So it's about two moons to get to, uh, get to Ethiopia. Uh, before we got to Ethiopia, there was, a, there was no, uh, like I said before, things such as wildlife, uh, lions and hyenas or other things were killing many, many of us. They attack and kill, attack and kill. Others died because of starvation. Others died because of, its, of, of thirst. There was no water. And I remember at the time, there was no water. We went for about uh, almost two days with no water. Some of the boys didn't want to go. They want to die there and then, you know, we, we kept 
encouraging each other so we kept, you know, so we kept going. And uh, some didn't want to go at all. And we came to a point where completely it was just a disaster. Uh, others dying, others uh, drinking human urine. Uh, we add mud. Mud is like mashed potatoes, you know. It's, um, and that helped a little bit. Like I said before, we were 27. But at the time when we got to Ethiopia, we were only four, four of us. So that means we lost about 27 uh, lost boys. Now we got to Ethiopia in numbers like four of us, and five, and 10, whatever number. Then we accumulate, we converge in Ethiopia into a, a little place there. It was just completely, it was, it was not a city, it's just a porous. And so the Ethiopian government uh, uh, organized that area to become a refugee uh, center or a refugee camp, and that is uh, called Penedo. We, uh, we were put in a group of 50. Like I said before, I was 12 years old, but I was taller than the other boys. So I was put in charge of one group. My group later, they add some of the boys in, so my group became 1,200 uh, lost boys. Their age were from age five to age 15. And then you can see these boys are crying every day. They want to eat food. They want to see their mothers. They want to drink milk. So the other boys and I, what we can do at the time was that to uh, say, hey, you know what? Today is bad. Tomorrow may be good. Trying to encourage each other. Diseases such as cholera, typhoid, uh, measles, chicken fog, wolf and cough, malaria. All, all killing boys every day. There was no hospital, no clinic at all. I remember in, 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 uh, in my own group, uh, about two or three boys dying each day, every day. And then we can um, take their bodies so that we can give our brothers dignity till we can bury their bodies. Tomorrow, we'll come back to bury the bodies of those uh, who died. Then we could, we could find the bodies of those we buried yesterday eaten by hyenas or other wild animal at night because we dug only just shallow grave because there was no energy really. That was a very graphic part of our life story. But we didn't give up. Uh, you can see here and there and others were kind of lost their mind. Uh, they even smeared themselves with, their, with species, you know. It was just terrible. But we stay there. Anyway, we stay the course. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, which is known as UNHCR, later brought, they, know, they knew about us, and then they brought some food, and it was good. And then they start bringing clothes. So if you get the blanket that you wrap yourself at night here, any blanket, then you are you're okay. Because at night you can wrap yourself with it, daytime you can cover yourself and, you know, to close yourself, because almost everybody's naked. So it was, uh, and then we, we kept going, and then the United Nations did a good job, especially World Food Program, brought more food and more food, and then even distributing powder milk. So that the boys who were looking for milk or were just uh, kind of went crazy uh, given milk, and they looked like, this is like uh, uh, the, the milk they got in, the, in southern Sudan. We stayed there for four years in Ethiopia. Our life was getting better, start playing around because there were more food, there were, you know, then they built a little clinic there. It was just wonderful. But the, our problem did not end there. The government of Ethiopia at the time, which was good to us, was overthrown by the Ethiopian rebel based in Northern Sudan. And now, the new government, which is the current government of Ethiopia today, didn't want us to live there. Look, the number of the lost boy became, number of the lost boys, lost girls, and some adult became 27,000 of us. Big camp. Now, as we are moving back to southern Sudan, uh, they gave us seven days to cross the border. And as we're moving back, there's a number of people, and there were no car. We stopped at a place called Gilo. Gilo, Gilo is a river. That river infested with a lot of crocodiles in it, and then. So we, ca we came there and stopped there. There was no way to cross that river. And uh, I remember we were trying to find a way, how we, like we tie a rope on, a, on a, a tree on one side of the river, have someone swim to the other side and tie the other end to a tree. 
so that for those who do not know how to swim can, can, can catch it and slide over to the other side. That didn't work out either. Uh, it took us about three days to figure out how we can cross that very dangerous river. Well, later, one of the days, the Ethiopian government actually sent troops up to us and they start shooting at us. We dive into the water. Uh, most of us didn't want to be. We thought as uh, the, uh, the Northern Sudanese troop came, and so we don't want to be taken to Khartoum to be either a slave or, you know, persecuted or forced into Islam. We didn't want to do that. And then uh, some were killed, others uh, drowned, others lost, others captured, others eaten by crocodiles. Uh, I and other survivors, we, crawl, we were very ha uh, lucky to cross the river and went to the other side of the river. Now, we went back to Sudan, not to our villages though, but to a place called Pochala. And we stayed there in Pochala for nine months. The Sudan People Liberation Army, which was the Christian African uh, re uh, you know, rebellion that is fighting the North, they were very nice to us, and they helped us, and then we share food with them, and then a few, few months later, we all ran out of food. And now, the clothes that were given to us by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, so we started selling them, like a, a coat or a, a pant or a shirt, T-shirt, whatever it is. You sell it with what? With um, a dry corn in a cup full of dry corn, then you sell your uh, clothes. All of us became naked again. It was just very tough to, to stay there because the government of Sudan sent uh, a Russian aircraft, a Russian made aircraft called Antonov. And they bomb us each, I mean twice each day. They bomb us in the morning and the afternoon. So we, we dug some trenches so, when we, so uh, we, we can de you know, detect that that airplane is the, uh, the bomber. And so we run into our, our trenches, say, and they bomb, some were killed. When it became really bad, we decided to move to the interior part of southern, southern Sudan to a place called Kapoita. It took us six months to get there on bar foot. Some of us were abducted on the way, killed. I, with the other guys who actually were better lucky, we got to uh, that area. And then we stayed there a little bit, and then we were attacked from there. And then we went to another place called uh, Nairus. Stayed in Nairus for two months. We were attacked there. And then in 1992, we made it to another country called Kenya. Now, coming to Kenya was good because the, the Kenyan government didn't allow the Sudanese uh, um, military to cross the, uh, the border into Kenya so we can hunt, hunt us down there. So there was one good thing. But another good thing, though, coming to Kenya was that they, um, they start, uh, they, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the World Food Program and others organized the area. There would be a refugee camp known as Kakuma Refugee Camp. They organized it and they even built a hospital there. Really good. And, and coming to Kenya was excited. But what actually made it so exciting to be in Kenya was the uh, introduction of um, education. At the that time, I was 17 years old. I had never been to any school of any kind. This is where I, uh, I start learning A, B, C, D, one, two, three. Start, uh, we start learning sitting under a tree, under a tree where our classrooms, sitting on the dirt, using my fingers as my pencils. Uh, to write all this thing. It was just wonderful because we're getting education, something we think. Education is so important that it's like my mother and my father because if you learn, you are educated, then you can get anything you want. It was wonderful. We, uh, I remember, uh, we kind of moved with the shade as, as, a, as a, uh, the shade kind of move and then we move with the shade, you know, and, and uh, during, uh, during examination, so a teacher will come around. You have to secure a big place in front of you, and then you do your uh, exam there. And the teacher will come and say, I think this is good, this is good. So it was very good. Now they build a very small uh, clinic, uh, uh, I mean, a small library there. 
And uh, for you to get into their library, you got to wake up very early in the morning about 3 or 4. And then you sleep there. In the morning, you will be among the people that will be allowed to, go, to enter into their library. And you know, you come with your, so you, work, you have to work harder from first grade, second grade, and third grade. If you want to go to fourth grade, you got to work harder. And there are incentives to, incentive to, uh, to go to fourth grade, to work hard to go to fourth grade. And those incentives is that in the United States we call uh, uh, the writing pad, you know, uh, called, uh, uh, in Africa we call exercise book. In the United States it's called, uh, you know, uh, uh, notebook. And so that notebook can be divided into two, cut into two, so that two people can share a notebook. Now, then they can uh, cut a pencil into, two, into three, so that three of you can share one pencil. So the idea of holding a pen, that's piece of pencils, and then you write on a, a paper, it was like an award. It was wonderful. So you, we work harder so you can be promoted to fourth grade, so you can get all these things. You know, and then you could also you will also be allowed to sit in a classroom. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees did a good job, and they built a building, and it was just wonderful. Uh, after that, it was wonderful. And then in 1999, when I was in my 11th grade, um, there came Americans. 1999, the Americans came there. They were my first time to uh, see an American. Uh, uh, person and they, um, you know, the way the Americans look at the time, they were very tall guys with long noses, you know, and uh, and when they speak, they speak as if they're speaking through their noses because uh, we couldn't understand what they were telling us. But what the Americans were telling us was that they would bring us to the United States. While we didn't believe them, and in in, in uh, the year 2000, when I finished my high school and when I was 26, I was 26 years old, finished my high school there, well, they, the Americans came back again. And they say they will take us to America and they start doing paperwork and they're taking some of the lost boy to, uh, and the lost girl to Nairobi. Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya. Well, it became, this is real. I think they're going to take us to America. Uh, some of us now start thinking they know America. Now a, a perception can kick in and they think they know America. And I, I remember my, uh, a friend of mine told me uh, that, uh, you know, if you go to America, because America's subject is always, when, when you see people sitting there, they're talking about America. They think they know America. And one of my friends told me that, you know, it's okay to go to America. And, and it is okay to be lazy in America. Because when you are lazy in America, the American people will tie a green card at, at your neck. And you can go to any restaurant in America and eat for free, you know? <laughs> well, the other boys, the, you know, it was something nice. But also, they told us that America have a better good technology. And that technology also found, not only in the offices, but in the restaurant, too. You, you want to go, you want to eat at a restaurant in America, there is nobody there will serve you. What you do is you sit in the, you sit in the front of a big table, there's a big table, uh, sit in front of that big table. On that big table, there's some uh, button on the top. There's chicken button, beef button, and vegetable button. So if I want to eat chicken, I just push chicken button, and chicken appear rolling from nowhere, you know. <laughs> I said, that is the place that I want to go, you know? <laughs> it sounds good to have put all this uh, chicken button. And, and uh, again, you know, Michael also, you know, many, many perceptions. Even one of my friend, Michael, he, he told me that, told us that, uh, and giving us warning about American girls. And, and, and he said, you know, if you go to America, be, be very careful. American girls are crazy. And they said, how crazy they are. And he told us that, you know, in America, they, they, the girl carries small bags. Everybody carrying small bags, those girls. And he asked, do you know what is in those bags? We say, no. And they say, well, they have gun in it. <laughs> if you mess up with an American girl, they will shoot you, you know? Well, I said, you know, uh, 
it's a country where you have this button, food button, and the women are killing people, what can I do, you know? <laughs> well, then my name came out on the board. There's John, you're going to serve in New York. I said, okay, I think I will go. If it is because of uh, all these things such as women killing people, I stay away from girls. <laughs> you know? And then I was flown to JFK and then to Syracuse. As we were, mer were coming out of the uh, uh, a corridor, there were about 14 Americans waiting for us outside from our church. Well, uh, I think when I got out, I was, uh, I was in front because we were three. Uh, and then they, you know, uh, one of them running up to me and say, are you John, hello, you know, I think they know us because we're very black and very skinny. Uh, so they knew that these guys come from Africa, you know. So uh, I said, yeah, we are, and they greet us and we greet each other. It was just wonderful. But there were four girls there, you know. Uh, I didn't want to go and hug them. I may mess them up and kill me, so I stayed <laughs> So they took us to our apartment, and honestly, I didn't know how to turn on or off light, just light. So they show us, three of us were shown how to uh, use the light. This is how you, you twist it, this is how you do that, all these things. Uh, hot water, cold water that way, you know, uh, refrigerator, this is what you put in the refrigerator, this is what you do, you know, all these things. It took out the whole day, orientation. And then later they took us to a grocery store to show us how to shop, how to do groceries. Well, I was following Susan Myers as we were coming closer to a door, and the magic door opened itself like this. You know what? I was so amazed. And you know what I was thinking? I said, I, you know, I think the American people are better lazy. They don't want to pull the door or push the door. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't tell them, you know, at the time. Anyway, they show us all these lots of foods and a fun aisle of foods and, and even, honestly, and even, I, you know, I, I said, this country is so wealthy. Even they have aisle of dog food and a cat food. <laughs> I couldn't believe, you know, even animals have their, their aisles, uh, you know. It was, it was wonderful. Anyway, um, so we stay in America for, for uh, Three months, what I call our honeymoons, because we were not allowed to work. They provide us with a put stamp, and people in our church helping us, showing us how to take a bus, how to go to a library, how to do almost everything, you know. And they're showing us how to find a job, how to read a, a column at a news local, you know, a local newspaper. All these things. So I call it our honeymoon because it was just great. It was a good time. And, and there were no girls killing people, you know. So it was, that was very good. But then I said, okay, now I am in America. When our three months finish, I start working at McDonald's. Grilling hamburgers, doing dishes, and working at UPS, and as a security guard. It was just wonderful that I can be able to work you know, and support myself and support people back in Africa. It was just wonderful. But then I said, well, okay, I, I'm, I must go to school. So I, and I enrolled at Onondaga Community College. I finished my associate degree in 2004. Then I transferred to Syracuse University Maxwell School of Citizenship. And, um, and then I finished my bachelor's degree. But then I said, okay, you know, here I am in America. I am help. I am, you know, in this great country where I can work, where I can find a job. What can I do? You know, can I just sit down here, eat, and enjoy myself? I said, no. I am here for a reason. The reason as to why I survive, there is a reason. And then I decided to form an organization called the Lost Boy Foundation of New York. It became my first organization. And I got 51C3 and I raised about $35,000 for the Lost Boys in Syracuse, New York, so that they can help themselves. And then I said, well, so when you got to America, 
If you are in America, it's, it's a help of your success. You know, so the, anybody in America here, you really don't need help. Those guys, those Sudanese guys. I want to help people back in Africa. So I stepped down from that, my first organization, and then I formed another organization called American Care for Sudan Foundation. That organization, I want to form it so that I can build a medical clinic in Sudan. Uh, and um, it became 51C3. I raised over $800,000. And I, you know, with the help of people in in the Skinny Allison, Central New York, and Syracuse, and uh, across America, people that have been sending checks and supporting us, we were able to build a medical clinic in 2007 and start operating it until today. I might have raised over $2 million to build that medical clinic and run it. Since we start, we have treated over 60,000 people ever ever been to any doctor. We have vaccinated over 7,000 children, uh, vaccinated against diseases such as measles, chicken fog, wolf and cold, all the other diseases. Since we started, we have, we have had over 800 mothers give birth at the, that medical clinic. These are the first women ever since the creation that ever been to a doctor during pregnancy and during birth. And these are the first children that will know their birth date. I don't know when I was born. I really don't know what date. So uh, I don't know date. We just assume it's this, that. But these are the first children that we're going to do that. That medical clinic, we have blood bank. We have a high-speed internet. Actually, it's going to end uh, in December. But, but still helping us with Skype and other system that there. That medical clinic, we have ambulance. We are only the one, only a medical facility that have ambulance in the entire Southern Sudan, the Republic of Southern Sudan. We are the only one to have ambulance. We are doing HIV aid. We are treating almost, almost everything that you can think of. Malaria, and typhoid, and HIV AIDS, and other things. I'm doing this because I said, this is what I can get, can take from America, bring it to my people, and my people will know how good is the United States of America. I did not stop there, though. I formed another organization called the American, uh, the, called the South Sudan Institute, is to do agriculture, do education and peace and reconciliation. Why am I doing that? Is because I am, I'm afraid my people will grow what I call a gimme gimme syndrome where there will not be self-reliance, maybe be only depending on what I'm doing or, or hand out, in other words. So I'm bringing this agriculture so that people can do it themselves. You do it, you can't work, you don't eat. And, and build their capacity uh, with that. That's what I'm working on. Now, you know, I brought my mother and my sister to United States. I have a home. I have a place that I call it a home. This is my house in Syracuse, New York. The uh, movie of some of you watch that narrated by Nicole Kidman, produced by Brad Pitt, it's all, was uh, distributed by National Geographic, and I am one of those uh, 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 you know, uh, main characters in the movie. As Cliff said before, there is a book my book. So it's what I call, uh, you know, it's, it's a progress. So I wrote that book uh, also. You know, and I am a married person. I didn't know that I would survive to even have a family. I have three kids, my children, they're all under age five. And, and look at me today. I'm not grilling hamburgers. I'm not working at UPS. I'm not you know, uh, working as a security guard. You know, I have been so successful and even became a friend of people that I call heavy hitters. People like Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, they gave me $100,000 and these two became my friend. You know, I have been actually super successful in the United States in my nine years. I've been here for nine years in America. Now, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. 
Now I start talking about my success. I have done this, I have done this and that. You know, let me ask you this, really. Do you think I'm here to, to show off? To come in front of you and say, hey, look at me, I'm a great man and in the nice suits and have done good things, you know? Well, brothers and sisters, I'm not here to show off. I'm completely not here to say, look at me, I am a great person. If you might have listened to the first part of my life story before, it was just great. It was, it, was, it was bad. You know, when I was between my, my, my village to Ethiopia and back to Sudan and all of this journey for 14 years, I didn't know whether I would survive. I did not know I would survive. I did not know whether I would be the next person to be eaten by wild animals, such as hyenas or lions or crocodiles. I did not. I did not know that I would be the next person that would die of a disease. Really, and I saw many people, that of my friend, dying here and there. Like I said before, the situation forces me to chew grass like a cow eating wild fruits and drinking human urine and, 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 and eating mud. I did not know I would survive. But I did. I survived. And here I am in front of you. It was really bad for me. But, but I survived. And that's why I always say, you know why I survived? It's because of two things. Is that number one is because of the Almighty God. God helped me to bring me to where I am today. The second to, to that, the reason as to why I survived is because I didn't give up. I did not give up. I stayed the course, I pushed on, and I kept going. Until I am here at Google. I'm here today in front of you and talk to you about, about my life story. So I'm asking you this. So why is it sometime in our life that when we are faced with the difficult task or in a situation in our life when we have a problem with our partner at home, at, 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 at our work, at school, somewhere else? Why is that when we are faced with all these difficulties we just give up? We just quickly give up. Even here at Google, even here at this company, you might have, you might have things that are difficult for you, such as how you become creative. How will this company become creative? How are you gonna, how are you gonna create so that you can keep your job? What, what is that the big idea that you're gonna bring to Google to actually uh, secure your place. Maybe you have that. Maybe some do not have that, what, what I'm talking about. But what I'm trying to tell you is that we as human beings, we are always faced with the problem. In our life, whether it is at, 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 at a small degree or at a, a, a larger uh, extent. But what we do always, including me, is that we give up quickly. So that's why I accept to come to Google today to share my life story. And I want to tell you this, that, you know, if you want to succeed, I learned in my, my many years in, in the jungle without parent, without any support, until today. I have learned that if I want to succeed, I must struggle. Because success and struggle is a package. It's a one package that you can never, ever separate. So, well, in America we say, well, you know what, I think the reason as to why I'm not succeeding is because I was abused when I was young. If you might have been watching the, uh, the trial of uh, Casey Anthony, that she did all of this because she was abused. That's nonsense. You... There is no reason that you cannot succeed 
because you were abused somewhere else. I was abused. I was beaten to a point where I thought I was dead. But, but here in America, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to dwell in it that I was abused by the Arab. I'm not going to say, hey, you Arab, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to revenge. I'm going to pay you back. I'm not going to say that. I forgive them, and I'm moving on with my life. And so this is what I want to share with you today. If anything happened in your life many years ago or today, don't let yourself be held hostage of what happened in your life. Move on. Thank you very much. Yep, and uh, sometimes we say, well, eh, I'm not going to ask this question. It's very stupid. There's no stupid question. So ask anything that you, whether a private, I don't care. You could ask my family or whatever it is. So there's no brick world in me. Just ask anything that you can want to know about Sudan, the new country, the, um, my work, the John Dow Foundation, how you can support us or whatever. Whatever is in you, I mean, that you want to ask. Just ask any question. Jimmy said, if I ever saw my family again since I left in the, you know, that night. Well, Jimmy, you know, the time when uh, I came to America, and then remember we were talking about the girl killing people? So I was writing a uh, letter to my friend in Kakuma refugee camp, saying, hey, you know what, I, all these uh, women are killing people, it's nonsense. Nobody killing people, and it's a nice place and good, you know. So that friend of mine went to Uganda and Talk about America, that the great thing that the United States is doing is bringing some of the boys, uh, those boys to the to, uh, to United States, and he talking about what I told him. And he you know, cited me that my friend John told me this and this and that. Then my brother was there at the time. Remember my family, we were separated that night, and they went to Uganda, another country. Well, they fled somewhere, and then later, eventually they end up in Uganda. I was in Kenya, well, I was in Ethiopia and then Kenya. Well, my brother invited him to, to, uh, to, 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 to go to the refugee camp where my mother and my father were. And they, he, this guy was also interviewed. And so, and then he gave my address, Syracuse address. And my older brother, Alaire, um, sent an email, I mean, uh, wrote uh, a message to me that, and then put some pictures in it and said, you my brother, John? Uh, Learn that we are here, we are okay, and you, you can watch from the movie too if you want to re watch the movie later. Um, and then, or if you're not my brother John, then disregard it. So, I, uh, I got that letter uh, October, 18, two, uh, October 18, 2002. Uh, it was just wonderful that I can see their pictures, I can, that my family is still alive. I was so happy. And from there I start the uh, process of bringing all of them here. But they uh, the rest were denied because in America they have this um, um, policy of you cannot bring somebody who is above age. But you can bring your mother. And then, so I start, uh, you know, applying for my mother to come. And then my mother was able to bring my younger sister that was born when I was away. So they came to, uh, to Syracuse and lived with us. And then 2008, my mother didn't want to live in America. It was too, it was too cold in Syracuse. <laughs> And so I took her back to, to, uh, to, to, to the village where my, my father, my father didn't want to come to America. Uh, and so that's how I was able to meet with them. And I went back 2005, met with the rest of uh, my family members, uh, although some of my uncles were killed uh, that night, uh, about three uncles with their children and wife, all wife out. Uh, but my family, the nuclear family, able to, to survive. Hi, thanks for coming here. Uh, I saw the other movie, not yours, The Lost Boys of Sudan, and um, I got the impression that when the Lost Boys came here, that, that followed some boys that were brought to Texas, that there wasn't really anything set up for them. They relied on the generosity of the people from the church, but the government which had brought them over didn't have any plans for their education, 
and they got terrible jobs and stuff like that. And I wonder if you can talk about your experience um, when you first got here, like after your honeymoon period ended. Um, did you have frustrations or did, was it a pretty positive experience for you? Well, yeah, thank you very much. Um, when we first came here, whether the government were not helping us, or whatever it is, it was better than where we were. So we couldn't see any different that we were mistreated or something like that because where we were in Kakuma refugee camp, in those refugee camps, we were actually running for our life almost literally every day. And there was no enough food that we can get. And there was no place. We were like in a big prison. We we're not allowed to go to a place like um, San Francisco from here. So we're not, we were restricted by police. The Kenyan police wouldn't allow us to go anywhere. So we were like literally like in a big, uh, big uh, prison. So when we came to America, although with such a small help, we appreciate that because we didn't have that before. The government of the United States uh, did not set anything up to, uh, to, uh, to help us other than agreeing that we can come to America. And then the local, that's what is good about America. This is what good about the United States of America. The people are so generous, you know, that they can help you, even if without seeing you. Like I said before of, uh, uh, you know, Anastasia before, and, and, and so many of you, uh, that they can help you even if they have nothing to do with you or close to you or something like that. So, so then the American government uh, didn't, didn't set anything up. And then, it was, you know, well, because of the generosity and the pouring of love that we got from people overshadow what we would uh, expect from the government of the United States of America. And, it, you know, and going to school too, like I can get uh, financial aid. My mother, my father, none of my family members ever work in the United States to pay taxes so that I can get uh, financial aid. That alone also make us even to appreciate the United States government. We think it's come from the government. Look, it, 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 there was nothing like that. Like in my case, I work hard, get my good grade, then I, then I was not, th th then I get more uh, uh, scholarship. I don't know if I borrow, I think I borrow a little, maybe under 2000 or $3,000. Then I finish my, high, my uh, uh, education. Um, bachelor's degree because I kept my uh, grade up. But, but I was so amazed of a country that is so generous that it can give me, even if I borrow money, even if I borrow financial aid money, I thought it was still think that is great. The United States is a great country. Although the government didn't set anything up, uh, as I said before, but the generosity of the other American people, the people, could, could, couldn't allow us to see that the government is not even treating us well. Oh, okay, sorry. I came off the mic. Um, you have emphasized, and uh, I've heard so much about Lost Boys, and I actually just want to say thank you. Thank you for being courageous, and thank you for uh, coming here to teach us, um, tell us your story. Um, but I really want to go back to, I've heard a lot about lost boys, and, but what about the lost girls? What happened to the girls? I've not heard the stories about the girls. So I was wondering if you know a little bit, you could tell us. Good, good question. Um, uh, that's always question us. Now, why lost boys always, know, what about lost girls? As I described it before, every time that the people in the northern Sudan, the troop, attack any village in southern Sudan, what they do is they burn down houses, they rape women, they abduct girls, kill young men. Those girls abducted to be taken to northern Sudan, their wife. So that's why you can see the, uh, the number of girls were not many. They were taken to northern Sudan to become their concubine or whatever pose, wipe, whatever, whatever you can, they, they can call it. And that is, the, uh, the evidence is that uh, the United States and, and the United Kingdom 
set up a foundation called Buy Back, B-U-Y, Back. Buy Back Foundation was set up to raise money, to take money to Northern Sudan, and buy a girl back. Well, an, Ar an Arab guy, I mean, the guy in the North said, well, uh, well, I bought this woman, I bought this girl. How much? Well, they, they could, whatever number. And then the buyback, give them money. And then bought those women, those young women, back to their freedom. So this is why you, can see, you cannot see more girls. That's one reason. Another reason, there were also girls. They were in Kekum, a refugee camp, and they were in Ethiopia. But when the Congress in the United States here uh, uh, passed that the, uh, maybe, maybe let me go back again. The United States have a migration policy every year. They bring number, whatever number of people each year to America, every single year. What they do is they talk to United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees who really need to be resettled. The UNHCR said, well, there are lost boys in Kakuma that have no future, but if they can come to America, they can uh, uh, change their life and whatever it is. Okay, then the, the Congress pass it as lost boys, not girls. So there were girls in Kakuma, and um, since it was only lost boys, girls were not able to come. And we asked why though? I mean, girls were with us. And so, but some, about 198, managed to come to America, which one of them is my wife now. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can come later. That's it. Oh, you're here, okay, sorry. Well, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be here today and to meet you. And I'm here as my daughter's guest. Um, we made our first trip to Africa um, in December, and I really left a piece of my heart there. And we're trying to find out ways to go back and this time to volunteer to um, just to give back. And because we did truth truly leave our hearts there and when my daughter told me you were going to be here I wanted to come and I just have one comment to make uh, I'm a teacher and I so much of what you said touched my heart but especially when you talked about taking one pencil and breaking it into three pieces and taking a notebook and tearing it in half and how grateful you were to have those supplies. And I work at a school, um, very, very privileged children who waste paper and waste pencils. And um, when I go back to school in September, I want to talk about this with the students. Um, so thank you for being here and sharing. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I just, I find it really challenging to stay up on top of what's happening in Africa. It feels like the news doesn't pay very much attention to it. So to find out about what's going on in the DRC or in Sudan, it's like you really have to seek it out. And so I'm wondering if you, I guess, have any suggestions on great news sources, if you or if any organizations are thinking about how to make it more sort of front and center in the US media and how to attack that. Um, and then also how to sort of understand how to get involved. Like, you know, when I do hear snippets, usually from like BBC late at night on NPR, it's like you're so taken by what you're hearing that you want to help. And it's actually hard to find resources. Like, I think I've, I've given to Save Darfur because it seemed pretty reputable. But online, it's sort of hard to understand who you can trust and who you can say, OK, this is actually going to you know, the right organizations. And so do you have any guidance there? Um, and I just, I guess, as someone that's looking for fundraising, I'd be interested in understanding how you address that. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think that is a problem that we had. Do you, the, the war in Southern Sudan had been going on for many years. No news, no major news outlet that are picking up completely 
About 2.5 million people died in between North and South from 1983 until 2005. No single news outlet or like a major, let's say maybe Fox News or CNN or others are not even talking about it. So, uh, and, 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 and we say, so where were the media? So why were, you know, we're not we're allowed to be uh, uh, killed and, 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 and then we suffer and so really nobody know about us. The war in Darfur started in 2003. Darfur is the western part of our region, I mean of, of Sudan. Started in 2003 and it became known, which is good, which is really good. Media have done wonderful job on that. But what about South Sudan? Why, why was this thing was not picked up? The war and everything. So I really don't know how you, how could you guys stay on the top of the news. Yeah, every morning I checked a, a, a news outlet in Sudan. There is known as Sudan Tribune. Sudan Tribune, I check it. That's where I hear about, I mean, what is going on in Sudan. And so every single, single, single day. Now, but we would like to, we would like to, uh, I, I was talking, I was sending email to Wolf Blitzer of uh, Situation Room. You know, South Sudan is getting independent tomorrow. Why do you guys really, nobody's been talking about it. Nobody was not, I mean, was talking about it in a, in a week leading to where, to, to the independent day, three days ago. No, no major, they were, they're talking about other, you know, debt ceiling, it's all the other thing. I know it's good to American here, but also this is a wonderful day. Cover it. Talk about it more in the newspapers, in anywhere, online, and something like that. Uh, you, you, you work for Google if you wanna, <laughs> wanna do something, uh, you know, wanna do something with us, you know, the John Dow Foundation at South Sudan Institute. You're welcome. Actually, I admire Google, and actually, I have uh, you know uh, Gmail account, <laughs> and uh, so we've, uh, we we love you, Google, uh, and if 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 you could uh, love us back, that'd be great, you know. And actually, in Southern Sudan, we have only five cities that have internet. Only five. It's like New York, uh, Los Angeles, and other major cities in America that have internet, but the rest, zero. But add to that is our clinic. It's number six, it ha you know, but, but that is going to end soon. So I'm not, you know, I know bureaucracy everywhere, it's everywhere, but I heard that uh, those who work for Google, you just sit down and think of what you wanna do. Why don't you guys think of what you wanna do with us? Uh, with your comment, it's wonderful. Wonderful comments. Um, we have started uh, training teachers. We sent teachers from America to do teacher training. Uh, we have tr uh, trained uh, 14 teachers. We just started it. Because I know education. I never been to school until I was 17 years old. And so, if I have to give a gift, a gift of something, a gift of literacy is important. It's what I could give to my people. I start with health because you have to be healthy to go to, to class or learn something. But education. I transported 26,000 books, brand new books, from United States. They're now in Africa. I'm, 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 I'm struggling how to get money to, to build that library. So that it will be the same library we had in Kakuma, that little library. I want to build it. Now book is there. I just want to build a, a structure. So it was a great comment. What about your clinic? Do you have um, doctors and nurses and stuff from here to go over there? She's asking about what about my clinic? Whether do I have doctors from here and then go to our Africa? Well, uh, 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 yeah, it's some time. But we have doctors there. We have nurses there. We have uh, all, I mean, everybody there. I mean, the, the uh, lab technicians, the pharmacists, the uh, midwife, and regular nurses, and, uh, and uh, you know, PAs, like uh, equivalents of PA, position assistant, they're there, two of them. So I have about 38 uh, employees there. 
So yeah, but some go from America and help for a week or a, or a month. Um, uh, yeah, so so that's but but it's mainly operate there in South Sudan. Uh, we we could we could appreciate those who could go and do something and help us. Uh, and uh, but 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 we have uh, people there in in Sudan. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, so as everyone's been asking questions about how to help and how to learn more, I have to ask if you have shared with everyone how they can help your foundation and how they can help you, because I can't let you leave without <laughs> <laughs> passing that information on. Uh, I th thank you, Anasia. And uh, I have brochures. If you want to have one, that's good. It will be with me uh, later when I sign book or something. How to help? Uh, with your example, uh, you donate money and then a Google match it. I think you know what I'm talking about. So dollar to dollar, that's what Clip told me before. That's a dollar to dollar. So I know you guys don't have money, but if you think you could help us, uh, feel free to whether put in your time, spread the word. It's another great help too. Talk to your family members, talk to other people, or even throw a fundraise and I can come back again. Uh, if you organize your fundraise somewhere else, school somewhere else, and I can come back again and then I, s I will speak at that uh, fundraise. Um, or you just want to do what, uh, you know, uh, Ananasia di did before, uh, you know, that would that'll be, that'll be wonderful. So you can go to John Dow, johndowfoundation.org. Dow is D-A-U, it's not D-O-W. It's a D-A-U, John with H, and Dow with D-A-U, foundation.org. That's a health part of it. The education part of it is South Sudan Institute. South Sudan Institute is the three thing in one. So that's how anybody want to help us do that. And look, it's not always a potential help. That is what we like spreading the word, talk about it. And, and, and you know why, why I'm here is because of connection, what you did. And, and, and you suggest that I should, I should be here. That, that's important. That's really important. So uh, either way, whatever you can do, do that. Uh, if you want to, that a Google can partner with us, I think that would be really wonderful. Well, that's... Um we want to thank you very much for coming, John. That was a very amazing and inspirational talk. So thank you again for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>